Good morning, church. It's uh, really wonderful to be back, to be with you uh, together in God's presence. And uh, the title uh, of my message is How to Consider Your Present Sufferings. How to Consider Your Present Sufferings. So can you turn uh, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8 and read um, verse 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Let me read that for you myself. And this is Paul speaking. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So as you can see, the title of my message is directly from this verse, How to Consider Our Present Sufferings. And it speaks about how as Christians, we are to consider our present sufferings. And God is not silent about this matter. God has told us very clearly about our present sufferings and, and He wants us to uh, understand how to consider our present sufferings. So first of all, uh, we have to understand that Paul here, when he says present sufferings, he's not talking about uh, a very specific uh, circumstance that he is personally going through. When he says present sufferings, he's talking about sufferings that are present in our lifetime on earth. Sufferings that are present uh, in our time on earth. And he's talking about all forms of, of suffering, which uh, we will see. Now, why does he address the issue of suffering? led by the Holy Spirit, why does he talk about suffering? Because in the context, he speaks about how as Christians, we have no condemnation before God because Christ has taken the penalty for our sins and we stand before God fully justified, without fault. We stand before God blameless because of what Christ has done on the cross and we have no condemnation before God. And he's talking about all that and then he brings up the matter of suffering. Why does he address the issue of suffering? Because suffering is a shared experience. Suffering is something that we've all experienced. Would you not agree? Suffering is not a stranger to, to any of us. All of us have experienced suffering in some form or, or, or the other. All of us have experienced suffering in different measures, uh, you know, to different degrees. And so we know that suffering is no stranger to us. And the truth is, God understands our present sufferings, our sufferings during our time on earth. God understands more than we do. God understands more than we do. And I want to talk about uh, this uh, subject from the perspective of how suffering affects us. How suffering affects us. How the present sufferings affect us. And, and I want to tell you four ways at least in which sufferings affect us. One... It takes us by surprise. Number two, it looks random. It appears to be random and it appears to be accidental. Number three, it causes us pain. And number four, it feels pointless. It appears to be pointless. So I want to talk about this from these four aspects and how God responds to each. So number one, it takes us by Surprise. When suffering strikes, it does catch you off guard because you never saw it coming. You, know, you, you didn't uh, expect it. You, uh, you know, it, it took you by, by surprise and that's why people say this happened all of a sudden. You know, this, this happened when I was least expecting it. Uh, I never saw this coming. And the truth is, you know, that line of, of questioning actually causes more mental strain that line of uh, thinking causes you know, more mental strain and sometimes that becomes a much bigger problem than the actual problem uh, itself. But what about prayer? Because as Christians, we do pray. We do pray and ask God uh, you know, to protect us, to keep us uh, you know, from trouble. And the Bible fully supports and encourages us uh, to pray to God for protection. And it's true that God answers our prayers and God protects us from many troubles, many adversities. God rescues us from many problems and God shows us favor in many circumstances. We cannot deny that. That's why we pray and that's why we continue to pray. But there are sufferings which don't go away just because you pray. There are certain troubles which don't easily solve 
just because you pray. And if you are honest uh, about your own lives, you will see, you will realize that sufferings don't, all sufferings don't necessarily go away just because you, you pray. And that's something that we cannot deny. Because there are some sufferings that seem to outlast your prayers. There are some sufferings which seem to outlive your prayers. Take the example of Paul himself. Paul prayed about his suffering. He prayed about his specific problem. And he said, God, there is this thorn in the flesh. And, I, and I'm asking you to remove this from my body. And he said he prayed about it three times, earnestly, with all his heart. And he had all the faith that a Christian could ever need. And he prayed in faith. But that problem outlived his prayer. That suffering outlasted and outlived his prayer. But what was his conclusion? His conclusion is that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient to sustain me. God knows that sometimes we are taken you know, by surprise when sufferings strike us. And that is why he has actually foretold us that there will be sufferings in this world. There will be sufferings in this world. Turn to John chapter 6 verse 33. John chapter 6 verse 33. This is Jesus speaking in the gospel of John and he's speaking to his disciples. And he is uh, talking to his disciples about what to expect in this world. And one of the things that he mentions is very striking. And John chapter 6 verse 33 spells that out very clearly for us. Jesus is speaking here. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And in this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has not promised that your life will be free of all forms of suffering in this world. In fact, he seems to be saying the very opposite. He seems to be saying that in this life, in this world that we live in, there will be tribulation, there will be trouble, there will be sufferings. But praise God, he doesn't stop there. Thankfully, he doesn't stop there because that's not all he says. He goes on to say, take heart, take heart. I have overcome the world. So Jesus is telling us here very clearly that in this world there will be tribulation, but he doesn't stop there. He says, take heart because I have overcome the world. What is Jesus saying? He's saying this world is a scary place. This world is a big place full of problems, filled with problems. But Jesus is bigger than the world. And Jesus holds the world in his hands. That's why he says he has overcome the world. But, and before that, in this verse, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Why did Jesus say that in me you may have peace? Because one of the first things that happen when you, know, when you are in some kind of trouble, when you look at your own uh, suffering in life, is that you lose your peace. You lose your peace of mind. And your mind is probably running with all kinds of troubling thoughts. And you are anticipating you know, the worst outcomes. Uh, of your situation and so you lose your peace and Jesus knows that very clearly and that's why he says you will not find peace in your situation you will not find peace in your crisis you will not find peace in the people around you but he promised he said you will find peace in me in me in me alone you will find peace so the first thing we learn is that Jesus has told us foretold us that in this world there will be tribulations but he has also promised that in him we will find peace. And when you find peace in Christ, you realize that Christ is more than enough. When you find peace in Christ, you realize that he is all you need. He is all you need. So the bottom line is this. Jesus has told us to expect some level of tribulations in this world. He has not promised to remove all sufferings. But he has promised that in him you do find peace. It was Augustine who said, God had only one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. It was Martin Luther who said, To our Savior they gave a crown of thorns. Then why do we hope for a crown of roses? You know, you can ask a soldier and any soldier will tell you that you don't go to war and not expect to sweat or bleed. 
and the same way we don't expect to live in this world and not expect tribulations because Jesus said there will be tribulations but be of good cheer in him we can find peace so the first thing that we learn is that we don't have to be taken by surprise we don't have to be overly surprised we don't have to let the shock paralyze us because Jesus has foretold us and there are many other scriptures that show us that there will be troubles and adversities that come our way but we have the promise of Jesus that he'll stand with us and we can have peace in him so the first thing that uh, that happens to us is that we are taken by surprise the second thing is it feels random and accidental isn't that true when you think about the troubles or sufferings in your life it feels it feels random it feels uh, it might feel accidental it might feel uh, a, a bit chaotic i remember getting my first cycle when i was a kid it was a green color cycle uh, and i was waiting for this cycle so badly and finally my uh, you know my dad got it for me i don't remember how old i was but he got me this cycle and i was just waiting to take my cycle out for a ride and so i took my cycle and uh, i think it was uh, in the evening time i took my cycle out and my mom was standing right at the gate and you know she was watching me uh, you know like ride off on my on my cycle and uh, of course uh, you know being my first ride i was you know going at full speed right from the beginning and this was my first time riding a cycle before that i was only riding the small uh, you know uh, a kid cycle so i was you know riding at full speed and uh, and, uh, and and i remember looking down and and looking at my own feet and my my feet are going at full speed as i'm uh, uh, cycling and then i just look up and then i'm suddenly taken by surprise because i see a huge herd of buffaloes that are standing uh, you know in in the way and then i realize there's nothing i can do you know i'm i'm definitely going to run into one of those buffaloes and uh, who knows uh, what's going to happen next but somehow i just uh, you know I, i just i don't know maybe my um, reflex uh, action kicked in and i and i just jammed the brakes and as soon as i jammed the brakes the, the the cycle skid and then i was thrown off the cycle and i fell on the road and i went scraping uh, on the road and uh, i was actually uh, uh, injured but not anything major and i and i remember feeling that oh man this is so embarrassing and what's really embarrassing is the fact that my mom is still standing there behind me and watching this whole uh, thing take place and uh, i i remember you know thinking about that and realizing the nature of events like that are very random there's no structure to those uh, sort of events right it's very random it's very accidental it it feels like nature is just taking its its own course and it's something that is totally out of your hand it's not in your control it is just chaotic and sometimes sufferings make us feel that way it feels like it is just happening by chance it is just nature taking its course and there's nothing in your control there's nothing in your hands and uh, and and you just wait for for things to turn out the way they are and hope for the best and sufferings can make us feel that it's all just accidental that it's just random and it's just arbitrary but the truth is god says our present sufferings are not random our present sufferings are not random they are not arbitrary they are not you know sufferings that enter your life just by chance sufferings don't don't enter your life just as a result of nature taking its course they are not random god says that he ordains our present sufferings he ordains our present sufferings and i want to show that to you clearly from the scripture 1 peter chapter 1 verse 6 to 7 1 peter chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 it says in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials and these trials will show that your faith is genuine it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold and though your faith is far more precious than mere gold so when your faith remains strong through many trials it will bring much praise and glory and honor on the day when Christ is revealed to the whole world notice the very first uh, line in this uh, in these two verses that we read peter says in this you rejoice though now for a little while you have been grieved by various trials and uh, if you have the esv translation it actually says though now for a little while if necessary if necessary you have been grieved 
by various trials. I think that phrase is very important, if necessary. Because what Peter is saying here is that the sufferings, the present sufferings, the trials, the um, tribulations don't enter your life unless God deems it necessary. Unless God deems it necessary. They do not happen as a random chain of events. They don't happen as an accident. They only happen if God deemed it necessary. If God deemed it necessary to allow those trials and tribulations in your life. So God has ordained it. It is not random. And not only that, it says for a little while. That's very interesting. Peter says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while. God has not only ordained your present sufferings, he has also ordained the time period of your sufferings. You will not suffer one moment or one second more than what God has decided. Because God has ordained even the time period of your sufferings. God decides when it begins and when it ends. And Peter says, in this you rejoice. Because one of the reasons God may allow this is to uh, test our faith. It's to show that our faith is genuine. So that's the second thing. It feels random. It feels accidental, but it's not. God has ordained it. And in that we rejoice and in that we take comfort. The third thing I would say is that sufferings can make us uh, realize that it's a painful process. You know, it causes us pain. Suffering is, is not something that we, we, we think about. It is, it is something that we experience uh, in a way that is causing pain to our mind, to our body, uh, even to our own spirit. I remember as part of my you know, uh, master's degree just two weeks back, I had to write a forum post uh, you know, as one of my assignments on the problem of suffering, on the problem of evil and suffering. And uh, in the world of theology, we call this theodicy. Theodicy is how we understand suffering in the world that was created by, by God. And, and there were so many theories, you know, there is this greater good, you know, theodicy, which means God allows all that, uh, you know, all the suffering, you know, for a greater purpose. And then there are some other uh, uh, theodicies, which is, you know, God allows suffering to, to build our character. So there are so many such, you know, perspectives that uh, people can present from the Bible to justify why God can allow uh, sufferings. And uh, as a student, I, I was also presenting my, you know, case, uh, you know, my view on the theodicy. And I remember there was one post uh, that was um, written by a student which stood out from all the other posts. And he wrote saying, that I have read all the theodicies, I've read all the theories and all the perspectives that the Bible seems to give us on suffering. He said, but none of them comfort me. He said, none of these theodicies actually comfort me because in the time of suffering, I realized that these perspectives just sound as theories, just sound as theories. They, they, they just sound like concepts, but they don't really deal with the pain of the suffering. And that really stood out. And, you know, um, many other students replied to that post saying, you know, we, we are sorry uh, that, you know, you are facing, uh, you know, so something that is, you know, that is uh, causing you to suffer. Uh, but, but we didn't mean to trivialize your pain or, or um, minimize your pain by talking about, you know, theories. Uh, but that, that post really stood out to me. And I, re and, I, and I realized that in my own post, one of the things that I mentioned at the end was, we can talk about all these theodicies, we can talk about all the theories and concepts, but I wrote in the end that explanations do not comfort us. Explanations do not take away the pain. Theories and perspectives and theodicies, theodicies they don't take care of the pain. They don't remove the pain of the suffering. I said explanations don't comfort us. It is God who comforts us. It is God who comforts us. You take the story of Job. God gave no explanations to Job. Other than talking about God's own greatness. To get Job to focus on God's greatness. But God really gave no explanation. Still the end, Job never understood why he actually suffered all that he suffered. Because explanations actually don't comfort us. I mean, you think about um, getting a diagnosis from a doctor. They can clearly explain what is wrong, they can clearly explain what went wrong, but does that offer you any comfort? Explanations don't necessarily comfort us. It is God who comforts us. It is the presence of God that comforts us. It is the person of God who comforts us. It's the presence of God. And so we realize that, you know, suffering can make us feel a lot of pain, and then we realize that 
God doesn't stand distant from our pain. He doesn't stand far off, you know, from, from our present sufferings. And we know this from the shortest verse in the Bible. Do you know what that is? The shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. John chapter 11 verse 35, it says Jesus wept. That says a lot about Jesus. It shows that Jesus is not insensitive to your sufferings. Jesus is not enjoying the sufferings that he allows in your lives. Jesus is not minimizing or trivializing your pain by simply giving explanations. Instead, what does he do? He weeps. Now, many people have given different explanations for why Jesus, you know, was weeping. Some have said Jesus uh, wept because he didn't, uh, you know, he was, uh, he felt sorrowful because of the unbelief of the people. I'm not convinced by that answer. I don't think that would make Jesus cry, that people were uh, having unbelief. Some have said uh, that uh, Jesus was, was weeping for Lazarus because Lazarus is going to be raised by Jesus and Lazarus is going to come back into this world of, you know, suffering and pain and thinking about that, Jesus is suffering. I'm not convinced by that too. What I am convinced of is that Jesus is weeping because he weeps with those who weep. And the Bible tells us to do the same, to weep with those who weep. Now Jesus can explain what is going to happen. In fact, he is the one who is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He's going to turn this whole situation around. He's, he's got the whole situation in his hands, in his control. And yet he doesn't sit and explain. But he sits and weeps with those who weep. Why? Because he shares in our sufferings. He shares in our pain. He never stands distant. He never stands far away when he allows the sufferings in our lives. Because that can cause a problem, right? The, the doctrine of divine sovereignty can actually a, cause a problem if we misunderstand. We believe that God is sovereign, right? And that means God is in full control, absolute control of everything that he allows. But then that can, that can actually raise a problem because that can make you think that this, this suffering or this adversity that I'm in is because God has allowed it. And not only because God has allowed it, but God planned to allow it. Because when God allows it, it's not because God's hands are tied. It's not like God is helpless saying, I wish I could prevent the suffering, but my hands are tied. I wish I could do something, but I can't. That's not how God is. God planned to allow. God plans to allow. God's hands are not tied. And so that can make us think that God is insensitive. God is distant. God doesn't care uh, about the present sufferings. But that's not true. Because the same God who allows it also weeps with you in the suffering. And it's a mystery. The same God who allows it weeps with you in the suffering. And that means whatever suffering God allows, it doesn't mean he takes pleasure in those sufferings. It means he's with you in the pain. He weeps with you. And he understands you. And he understands your pain more than you realize. And so Jesus weeps with those who weep. And God does not enjoy the suffering that he allows. So Christ does not minimize the pain of our present sufferings. He doesn't give explanations and trivialize our pain. But he comforts us in our pain. He comforts us in our pain. And the last point I would say is that when suffering strikes, it feels pointless. It feels pointless. Isn't that true? It feels like there, is, there can't be any good reason for this to happen. I'm sure you felt that way. I'm sure you looked at your uh, suffering and said, I can't think of any good reason why God would still allow this and, and why this continues. I'm sure you would think, uh, you, you would, you would think uh, that you know, it doesn't make sense for God to keep this in my life and there's no way God can use this for any good. It feels pointless. It feels meaningless. And the feeling of pointlessness can actually make the suffering even harder to bear. Because it's tough to understand why you are going through it. Because isn't that the question we ask? Why? Why is the question we ask? Why? Because without the answer to why, it feels pointless. It feels meaningless. And many people have actually lost their faith at this point. Because they say, I cannot accept a God who can allow this. And, and, and I can't think of any reason... I will not accept any reason that God might want to give for allowing this. And many people have lost uh, their faith because of that. I don't know if you've heard of the uh, Epicurean objection against God. You know, it's a very popular objection that uh, happened, you know, many, many years ago. It was raised by a man called uh, Epicurus, I believe. And it's a very, uh, a very strong objection, but it was put in very simple terms. And this objection comes in three statements. 
right? It's very simple. He said, against the, object, uh, against the God, uh, existence of God, he said in three statements, if God is willing to prevent suffering, but he is not able, and that means he is not all-powerful. If God is willing to prevent suffering, but he's not able to, it means he's not all-powerful. And he's absolutely right. If, if God is willing to prevent, you know, if, if God is up there saying, man, I want to prevent this, I don't want this to happen, but then he's not able to, then it means he's not all-powerful. That was his first statement. His second statement, if God is able to prevent suffering, but he's not willing, he's not desiring to do that, then it means he is not all good. He's not all good. He's saying if God is capable of preventing the suffering, but he desires, he wishes to not do that, it means God is not really good. That was his second statement. And his third statement was, if God is both willing to prevent suffering, and if God is also able to prevent suffering, then why is there suffering in this world? And then he said, if God is not all good, and if God is not all powerful, why do you call him God? That was his objection, and it was so popular, it reached many people's minds, and, and, and people, uh, you know, uh, uh, people received it, uh, you know, and people, uh, people bought this objection, and, uh, and, and there were many who actually lost their faith in God, and this objection still runs today. Uh, you know, skeptics who speak against God's existence, they still use this, this objection. But when we read the Bible, we might be able to see where he went wrong. And where he went wrong is that he only assumed that God is all-powerful and God is all-good. But he did not also assume that God is all-wise. And the Bible tells us that God is not only all-powerful and all-good, but he's also all-wise. And that creates a new possibility. If God is all-wise, it means he can allow sufferings and redeem it later. He, can't, he can allow finite sufferings for our infinite gain. And that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. What is this teaching? Our present sufferings are producing a glorious future for us. Our present sufferings are producing an eternal weight of glory. Now the truth is we can't really describe what this eternal weight of glory is. We can't really describe what this great reward is that God is producing for our present sufferings. We can't really describe it, but we do know two things. One, it will be incomparable to our present sufferings. And it will be so incomparable that our present sufferings will look so trivial. It looks so light. It looks so momentary. In light of the future eternal weight of glory that God is producing for us. And so all the sufferings that God allows in this life, He will not only use it for our good in this life, but also for an, for an eternal good in the world to come. What does this mean? It means no suffering is pointless. No present suffering is meaningless. No present suffering for a child of God is without meaning and, with, and senseless. You know, it is, it is uh, compared to a mother who, you know, who, who was uh, in the process of giving birth to a child and because of her uh, bodily condition, the process made it far more painful than for an average mother. But, but when she saw her baby, she only had one thing to say, and that was the pain was worth it. The pain was worth it. Why? Because the pain fades in the beauty of the blessing. And that's what God teaches us. He teaches us to trust that. I wonder how many cricket fans we have here. I'm sure we have many cricket fans. Uh, I'm not a fan of you know, cricket myself. I don't really enjoy watching a game. I find it boring. Uh, no offense to, the, to our cricket fans here. But I, I wonder what your favorite game is. Um, you know, maybe it's a game, I'm, you know, I'm thinking uh, in which, you know, your favorite team, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Indian team was maybe about to lose or it, it looked like the Indian team was losing and you were getting anxious, you were, uh, 
you were getting nervous and you were getting frustrated because you know the uh, Indian team is not playing well and, and it looks like they are about to lose but then somehow uh, in the end you know it all turns around, the uh, Indian team finally wins the match. I'm sure there are matches like that and you probably remember, you probably have one coming to your mind right now. And maybe some of those matches would be your, your favorite matches because it looked like they were losing and it made you feel hopeless. It made you, uh, you know, throw your popcorn away but then finally, you know, you're, you celebrated because they made a comeback. Now imagine, you take one of those games and you, and you replay that game on your TV and you watch that whole game once again. How would you watch it? Your whole attitude will be different when you're watching a replay of the game. You won't despair. You won't feel hopeless. You won't get frustrated. You won't lose hope. Why? Because you know how it ends. You know the ending of the game. The end is certain. And the only thing God tells us is that you know how it ends. God has told his children how it ends. It ends with a glory that cannot be compared with our present sufferings. The eternal weight of glory is the ending of our present sufferings. And God has told us so that we can trust in his goodness and, and, and in his ordination of all the present sufferings. And I just close with a fascinating story from Mark chapter 6. And it's a story of the greatest man on earth according to Jesus and how he died, how he left planet earth. I mean, we all, we all uh, don't want a death that is painful. We don't want a death that is going to be uh, with excruciating pain. But here is a story about a man called John the Baptist. And he, he had a painful death because he was beheaded. He, his head was cut off to his death. And how did all that happen? It happened because, you know, Herod threw a party, as you know, and he had his uh, stepdaughter dance at the party, and this daughter was uh, dancing at the party, and it was very pleasing to everyone who was there, everyone who was watching the dance. Everyone was enjoying it. They were all loving it. And when she was done, she pleased all the guests. And so to reward her, Herod says, I'll give you whatever you want, you know, up to half of my kingdom. And then she goes to her mom, who hates John the Baptist because he preached against her. So she goes to her mom and she says, Mom, what should I ask for? What should I ask for? And then the mom who hates John the Baptist says, Ask for the head of John the Baptist on a tray. What a request. Ask for the head of John the Baptist on a tray. And then she walks back in. Everyone's waiting to see what she's going to ask of Herod. And then she tells Herod, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray, on a platter. And there is silence in the room. She can't take it back. And Herod cannot deny this request. And so he says, okay, we'll get it. We'll get the head of John the Baptist. And John was sitting probably there in his cell, in his prison and he was maybe wondering about how the kingdom is going to come. He's thinking about how the kingdom of God is going to advance and he's thinking about how he can contribute more. And then all of a sudden he probably saw the doors open to his cell. And then maybe two guys are standing there. One of them is the executioner. And there's a moment of silence and John doesn't know what's going on. And then the one with the sword says, John, come on over here, kneel down. And if you struggle, we'll have to bind you. If you struggle, we'll have to attack you. So don't try to struggle. Just come over here and kneel down. And John, John says he doesn't know what's going on. So he says, what happened? What's going on? And then the executioner says, well, the king's daughter danced at the party. And she asked for your head. And we've come to get it. So we're going to take your head. So we want you to come and kneel down so we can do that. That's probably the last thing that John the Baptist heard from a human being in the last few seconds of his life. Now, everything in me, you know, says that nothing could feel more meaningless and more pointless than a death like that. Because what can be more meaningless and more pointless than a girl who was at a party whose mom said, 
get his head on a tray. What could be more meaningless and more pointless than that? It feels absolutely meaningless. And, and I don't know what went through John's mind when this came to him all of a sudden. I wonder if he felt the meaninglessness of this situation that he was in. And so the last few seconds, he heard the voice of the executioner. And he was maybe struck with, with panic. But I think we can conclude that perhaps the last voice that John the Baptist heard was not the human voice, not the executioner voice. I think he heard God's voice before he died. And if there's anything God whispered in John's ears in the last few moments of his life, I can't think of anything else but this verse that we just read today. And maybe in the last few seconds of John's life, I think God whispered in his ears, this light momentary aff affliction is working for you an eternal weight of glory. I think that's what God would have whispered in John's ears before the last strike blow to his head. So no suffering is meaningless. No suffering is pointless for, for children of God because God is working all things together for good for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. And this light and momentary present sufferings is working for us an eternal weight of glory. And that's how we consider our present sufferings. Let's pray.